Good day, everyone. Today, uh, we will have a discussion on the deformation of actually loaded members. So, our lecture objective will be uh, to understand the concept of strain and stiffness of a material. The next one is to investigate and design correctly the materials based on the actual deformation of an object. What we will be doing in this lecture is that we will have the discussion of concept, theories, information related to the topic to attain objectives 1 and 2. We'll have an open forum and student evaluation to see how much you learn and what are your ideas to share with others. And we will have problem solving to apply what we learn. We'll also have a lecture evaluation at the end of the video so that I can improve my delivery of lecture. So we will be needing calculators, notes and pen, and the references for our lecture today. So let's start with the definition of strain. Strain is a geometric quantity that measures the deformation of a band. As you can see in the figure, the object that's color gray is subjected, uh, is not subjected to any form of force. Now, if it is subjected, subjected to a compressive force, there will be a compression. So the length of this object is being shortened because of the compressive force. Likewise, if a tensile force is applied to this object, or a tensile force is applied on the centroid of this object, it will elongate or the length of the object will increase. Now, if there is change in length, there is also what we call the strain because this is the amount of deformation of the body. So in the figure, you can see the behavior of the strain is normal strain. So when the deformation is normal to the surface, so meaning to say uh, when the load is applied actually on the object and then it deforms along its longitudinal axis, then that is what we call the normal strain. There's also another type of strain, uh, like this one in the figure. You can see here the shearing strain. Because of the torsion applied on this member, the planes in a differential segment of this member is sliding past each other because of the twisting mechanism caused by this torsion. In the second figure, we have here a cube that is applied with the force F this is uh, parallel to the surface area. And then uh, you can see that this causes shearing on the plane. So this is a shear strain compared with the normal strain. So the behavior from the normal strain, the force that causes deformation is perpendicular or normal to the surface. Likewise, in a shear strain, it is uh, parallel to the area that is being sheared. So these are the two types of strain. They both cause uh, deformation. So again, the, the unit of deformation or the amount of uh, the deformation defines the strain. Actually, strain is the measure of uh, deformation relative to the original shape of a material or an object. So stresses and strain are two fundamental concepts of mechanics of materials. Their relationship to each other defines their mechanical, uh, the mechanical properties of material. So if uh, the material is uh, stiff, therefore it has high resistance to deformation. Therefore, for a certain uh, value of applied force, if the object is stiff, there will be minimal deformation leading to a minimal value of uh, strain. But if the object is less stiff or more slender, then with, this, uh, with the same amount of stress applied to the object, there will be a greater value of deformation causing greater value of strain since deformation is um, proportional to strain. So we have here an example of an object that is being deformed under the application of load P. The figure above shows here a cantilever beam that is applied with an actually loaded um, load P 
uh, we have here sa, uh, points O and A along the length of the beam. So the undeformed state is that the initial position of O is here and A is uh, just at the right side or right portion of point O. Then when P is applied, there will be change in length of this object. So this point O is no longer in its original position. Likewise, A is no longer in its original position. So we have now O prime, which is the new location of point O, and A prime, the new location of A. This is because there is a deformation due to the uh, force applied P. Now, the amount of deformation, if the original distance between O and A is delta X, we have now um, the, uh, the distance between O prime and A prime equals to delta X plus amount of deformation caused by this. Now, this uh, delta deformation is the deformation only for segment OA. Uh, when we are talking about the total length of the object, the total deformation is uh, this one. But for the segment OA, since we're dealing with the um, differential segment OA, there is also a differential uh, placement. So strain is, again, unit of deformation uh, relative to the original length. So we can write that in the equation that the strain is the percentage of deformation relative to the length. So it could be expressed uh, as unit less value because uh, as you can see, the unit of deformation is a uh, uh, unit of measurement like inches and uh, length is also a, a unit can be expressed in inches, millimeters, so they will cancel out eventually. So we have strain is actually a unit less value. Actually, it could be expressed in percentage, but usually they are expressed in decimal. It just represents how much is being, uh, uh, how much is the deformation relative to the original length of the object. In reality, strain may not be equal throughout the length because uh, some materials are non-homogeneous, uh, some materials are non-isotropic, but in our lecture for today, we'll assume an isotropic and homogeneous material uh, so that we will, uh, we will consider that the deformation throughout the length is similar to each differential segment. But in reality, there is a variance in every segment of this object. Now, if we want to get, for example, a strain at the differential segment OA, therefore we have to get a differential length, Bx. So, for example, that this differential segment from O to A is defined as Bx. Now, the strain for this differential segment is also a differential strain. Now, uh, Strain can be expressed as differential uh, strain, dif uh, differential deformation over the differential length. If we write this equation, we can have the differential uh, deformation is equal to strain dx. Now, if we want to get the total deformation throughout the length of the object using this equation, we can have uh, we can use the integration. So we we apply the limits from the initial value zero to the total length of the structure or the member. Now, if we integrate this strain dx from zero to L, we'll have the total deformation of the object. When the strain is constant throughout the length, we can place the value of a strain outside the integral sign and perform the usual integra integration. We'll have the strain equals to deformation over length. This is actually the value of uh, the strain uh, for a body that is subjected to action load causing normal strain. So strain again is proven here equal to deformation over length for an actually loaded member that exhibits normal strain. Can we recall stress 
and strain defines the strength of materials. So recalling stress is equals to the amount of force applied on a certain area, while strain is equals to the amount of deformation relative to length. So these two equations will be uh, will be uh, merged later on in the discussion. So let's have first the stress and the strain diagram. This is the stress strain diagram of a usual structural steel used in construction of buildings. Now, there's sir, uh, there's some important points along the stress strain curve. So this uh, graph was generated by having a sample uh, gripped into the universal testing machine and then being pulled or applied with a tensile force. Now there is a co two control points here that are being observed. So the two points are measured uh, initially having a value of L. And then once the experiment is done, uh, as the researcher increased the value of P, the stress also increased. And as the stress increases, likewise, the deformation also increases. Now, uh, this, is, this test was performed to determine the stress strain graph or diagram of a steel. So that's some important key points in the behavior of steel will be um, analyzed. So during the analysis, it was, it was observed that when the stress is increased, also the, the, the strain, or uh, the, the value of strain also increases. At the proportional limit, it was observed that the stress strain diagram is behaving, behaving in a linear are exhibiting a linear behavior. So this is from 0.0 to the proportional limit. So it could be concluded that the stress is pro proportional to strain within the proportional limit. So take note that this is a straight line. So we can say that the stress is proportional to the strain. So if we replace the proportionality to equation, we have to introduce a proportionality constant k, and then eventually this k is substituted with the value e, now termed as the modulus of elasticity or Young's modulus. It, it was coined, it was named after Thomas Young, who did the experiment or discovered that this, um, uh, this behavior. In the proportional limit, the stress is proportional to strain. So E can be described as the slope of the curve within the proportional limit and is usually expressed in Pascal or ESI. Uh, because as you can see, this is the stress over the strain, which has no unit. So the unit for Modulus of elasticity is similar to the units used in stresses. So basically, if you get the slope of this curve within the proportional proportionality limit, you can already determine the slope. If we have the opportunity to test or to draw the stress strain curve of a certain structural steel, you will see from there that Within the proportional limit, there is a straight line that is the relationship of stress and strain. Now, uh, by geometry, you can determine the slope and then eventually that will tell you the uh, modulus of elasticity. Now, after the proportional, proportional limit, there comes the elastic limit. So, a material is said to be elastic if after being loaded, the material returned to its original shape. When the load is removed, the elastic limit is, uh, as its name implies, a stress beyond which the material is no longer elastic or will exhibit a permanent deformation. Now, the permanent deformation is what we call uh, the permanent set. So, within the elastic limit, 
if you remove the stress in an object, it will return to its original length. But if you exceed the stress beyond the elastic limit, there will be um, a permanent deformation even if you remove the stress on the object. Now, right after the elastic limit, you will have the yield point. Now, uh, the stress strain diagram becomes almost horizontal as you can see in the figure. Just a little bit of change in the stress, there, uh, there will be an excessive deformation. So take a look, there is just a very uh, low increase in stress but there is a lot of strain. This is because uh, the steel has already yielded. So it's, uh, it's termed from the word yield and uh, just a, a very little increase in stress will cause it to uh, deform excessively. Now structural steel only exhibits uh, yielding where other steel do not have, they do, do not exhibit yielding. Now, uh, we have here different types of uh, uh, materials used in construction. So, you can see the high carbon steel. Uh, that's a very high uh, strength compared to cast iron, aluminum, and concrete. So, this is the usual uh, string curve of different uh, construction materials. Now, for materials that do not have a well-defined yield point, there is some procedure where uh, you can use the 0.2% offset, where in a 2%, a 0.2% strain is uh, or can be determined from the initial uh, slope. So you have here the first uh, the slope at 0.0, and then you will have 0.2%. We just simply offset this one and then the point of intersection between the stress strain curve and this uh, offset slope will be the value of yield point. This can only be performed if you cannot clearly define the yielding point in a material because uh, let's go back to the uh, stress strain graph of the uh, stress strain graph of the uh, structural steel. It is very obvious where the yield point is because there is an almost horizontal uh, portion of the graph where in a minimum value of stress causes a large value of strain. But for uh, but if you cannot look at that uh, portion of the curve, then you can use the two percent of or point two percent offset. So as you can see, we can continue with the ultimate strength. This is the highest stress on the diagram. And uh, the rupture stress, we have uh, the true rupture strength and the nominal rupture strength, where the failure actually occurs. Now, why is there a very high value of true rupture strength compared to the nominal rupture strength? The nominal ruptured strength, uh, the reason why it is... Uh, in terms of value because it is still measured from the original cross-section. But in reality, the true rupture strength, meaning uh, the area, the phenomenon of necking, reduces the cross-sectional area of the sample, causing a higher value of strength, higher value of stress. Because in reality, after the application of so much load to this uh, specimen, it will have or it will reduce its cross section so reducing the cross section actually increases the value of stress we're uh, recalling that stress is force over area now increasing the value of force and at the same time decreasing the value of area gives us a higher value of stress but for the nominal rupture strength increasing the value of force and retaining the original value of area would actually register a lower value of stress. So the true rupture strength is this one, with due consideration to the necking phenomenon. Now, um, the stiffness of material is actually defined by its stiffness. So a material deforms because of its applied load. Stiffness is the resistance of the material to deform. For example, you are trying to pull 
a still object, the reason why it's not um, uh, elongating so much is probably it has a very high stiffness or resistance against any force applied to it. But if you are holding a more slender object, for example, uh, uh, um, a clay maybe, so since it has a very low stiffness, just a little amount of force will cause excessive deformation. But it, if it has a high resistance of deformation, therefore it's stiffer. So the higher the resistance of deformation, the stiffer is the object. Uh, from the word itself, stiff. So how is the stiffness of an object determined? This is actually based on the two principles which are uh, stress and strain. So from the stress, the definition of stress is equals to uh, the modulus of elasticity multiplied by strength. This was uh, defined by Thomas Young. Can we go back to the presentation? Here, we have that the stress is proportional to strain. If we, if we remove the uh, proportionality, we'll have the proportionality constant E. And then rewriting this equation gives us this one. This is the relationship of stress and strain. And uh, from the previous subjects we learned, stress is defined as force over area and strain from our discussion earlier, we have the deformation and length. So, if we want to get the value of the P or the amount of uh, force needed for an object to deform, then we can solve for P equal to AE over L multiplied by the deformation. So, uh, rewriting this equation gives us the value of AE over L, which is the stiffness. So the stiffness is the amount or the resistance of an object to resist P. So P is equals to AE L over L multiplied by the deformation. Now, if you want to solve for the deformation given the value of P, then we can rewrite this equation into this one. Now we have L over AE multiplied by now, L over A E is now called the flexibility. It is the inverse of stiffness. So, the inverse of stiffness and flexibility, meanwhile, the inverse of flexibility is stiffness. Now, this is, these two equations are very simple. If you have the value of uh, deformation, you can solve for the amount of P required to exhibit a certain value of deformation. Now, if you have... Uh, the value of force, you can now predict how much will be the deformation of an object. So again, uh, if you are designing, for example, uh, for a limited value of deformation, meaning when you are just allowed to have a certain value of deformation and you have to check how much P can be accommodated by the object, then you use this equation. If you are um, investigating how much is the value of deformation of this object given the value of E, then uh, you can use this equation. Actually, you don't have to memorize this two. Uh, either of the two can be uh, memorized because it could be expressed uh, in two ways. Uh, this one, if we are actually trying to solve or derive the value of the total deformation the, tot the total deformation in a material considering a differential segment so considering considering a differential segment we have uh, the deformation is equals to the strain dx from 0 to l and then if we substitute or replace the strain with stress over the modulus of elasticity and replacing stress with force over area and then per performing the usual integration provided that P uh, provided that uh, P, A and E are constant then we can solve for the deformation equals to PL over AE which is similar to this one. So that is our first objective to understand the concept of strain and stiffness of a material. Now, 
Um, let's try to have the second objective, which is we should be able to investigate and design correctly the materials based on actual deformation of an object. Now, the procedure for analysis, using mechanics, we have to determine first the actual force acting on a body. Now, uh, the concept of determining the actual forces is totally based on your knowledge or your mastery of the statics of rigid bodies. Now, uh, once you determine the actual force or the actual internal force acting on the body, you have to list the property of material, the area of the material, the modulus of elasticity, and the length. Now, if you have now the force, the area, modulus of elasticity, and length, you can now solve for the deformation of the object. Now, in designing, it's actually based on the allowed deformation. So, we have to first identify the actual load that is being carried by the material. Then, uh, if the design is limiting the allowable deformation, then uh, you decide how much is the deformation solved, then you solve for the area. But if the area is actually the parameter, means to say uh, you are only limited to this uh, area, and then you select the uh, uh, you select the different material rather. So its design is actually of different considerations. So you can adjust the area, you can adjust the material or selecting a material with higher modulus of elasticity. So there are many ways on uh, doing the design. So just make sure you know this value that the formation is equal to PL over AE. If you are designing such that uh, this value is fixed, you are to solve for the required area of the material to keep the system safe, then the unknown is the area. Now, if uh, the area is uh, the area is strictly provided and the deformation is limited, you are to select what are the available materials and then you solve for the E. So there are, there's actually different parameter. It depends on the situation, on how you are to design the material. So let's try this one. This uh, problem was solved from our previous lecture on the analysis of internal reaction for an actually loaded member. So we are to determine the deformation for different segments AB, uh, BC, and CD. And uh, we are to identify when, whether the segment shortens or elongates. Uh, aside from that, we are also to determine the total deformation of the whole uh, beam. Okay, so the internal force from our discussion, it is the first one to be determined. But since it's already determined from our previous discussion, we have listed down all the internal reactions for each segment. So let's identify the deformation for segment AB. So the deformation for segment AB can be determined using the equation. The deformation for segment AB is PAB, the length of segment AB, divided by the area of segment AB and the modulus of elasticity. Since uh, this beam has a constant cross-sectional area, the value of A is equal throughout the length for segment AB, BC, and CD. Likewise, since this is a homogeneous material, your E is constant throughout the length. What varies here is the internal reaction for every segment. That's why I provided subscript for the force since there is a diff there are different values of internal reactions for each segment and each segment has different length that's why there is also a subscript for length so the deformation of AB is limited only for segment AB there is a different value of deformation for segment PC and for segment CP now I will just simply follow the equation PL over AE or you can also use this um, 
can also use this one, the formation. Uh, our equation would uh, we just place P on the numerator instead of, of placing it adjacent to the flexibility. Okay, so we cannot carry on with the calculations. Let's just simply substitute the values of uh, PAB. So PAB here is 35,000 kilonewton, ah, uh, 35 kilonewton, but uh, since I recommend using units of newton and millimeters, then uh, I suggest you convert that immediately in your solution. So this 35 kilonewton is converted to newton, that's why I placed here 35,000 newton, and the length is 1,500 millimeters. A is 3,000 square millimeter, and E is expressed in megapascal since uh, megapascal is uh, or can be written as newton per millimeter square. So we are now consistent with the units newtons and millimeter when using 200,000 megapascal. What I usually use is I really express everything in newton and millimeter and then automatically convert all stresses, modulus of elasticity in megapascal. Then I proceed now with the calculation. So the total deformation for segment AB is equals to 0 0.0875 millimeters. So uh, simple as that, we just have to uh, uh, perform this uh, formula. You just need the force, the length is there, the area is there, the modulus of elasticity then you can solve for the deformation. I think it will now be easy to solve for the deformation for segment BC. We'll do the same process. We just have to list down uh, the proper subscript. So the force should be using uh, BC, segment BC. The length will be segment BC. We can now determine the deformation for segment BC. Now let's substitute the value for PBC that is 10,000. And uh, the length is 3,000 divided by the area of the modulus of elasticity. Now, uh, in, mechan uh, in mechanics of deformable bodies, tensile forces are assumed to take positive values of deformation. So the tensile force causing elongation is taken as positive. Or um, elongation is taken as positive. So the deformation for segment BC is 0 0.05 millimeters. For the segment CB, uh, can be determined using the equation the same with what we used for segment AB and BC. Now we substitute the values again, 30,000, 3,000 divided by 3,000, and 200,000. Having the value of uh, deformation equal to 0 0.15 millimeters. Now, uh, we're not over with the exercise. It is also asked to determine the overall deformation. So the overall deformation of the object is actually just the algebraic sum of the deformation of each segment. So the total deformation can be determined by adding deformation for segment AD, segment BC, and segment CD. That is equal to 0.2875 millimeter meaning it has displaced 0.2875 mm or increased in length uh, 0.2875 mm if you want to solve for the strain you will just simply uh, divide this one with the original length of the up so the total bar elongates there you go uh, the annotation so this one uh, the second exercise this type of structure is new to our lecture. So we have here a rigid bar, AC, uh, carrying a load P equal to 100 kN. This is supported by hinge at A and a rod connected from B to a fixed surface at B. Now, rod PB has the following properties. The area is 2,500 square millimeter. Modulus of elasticity of 200,000 megapascal. We are to determine the vertical displacement of point C after the application of point B and the minimum cross-sectional area of rod BB if the vertical displacement of C 
is limited only to a vertical downward displacement of 2 millimeters. Now, this is uh, a problem that involves investigation and at the same time design. So, for the investigation, we will identify the displacement of point C because of the load applied P. But it is important for us first to identify the displacement or the elongation of BD. Obviously, this is intention. So, that's the only time we can solve for the displacement of node C. But how can we solve for uh, the deformation or the elongation of, say, of this rod BD if we do not know the internal reaction? Recall that the first step in determining the elongation of an object is determining first its uh, actual internal uh, force that will be uh, generated or that will happen inside this object. Now, uh, drawing the free body diagram of the rigid bar and to know the actual internal reaction at segment BD, we pass a cutting plane at segment B and then exposing the internal reaction. Once you, per, once you cut on an object, the internal reaction should be exposed. The direction of the internal reaction can be assumed downward, but since it's very obvious that this will be intention, it is uh, practical to assume that this is intention. Now, we have the free body diagram. We replace this support with uh, support reactions. Now, how can we solve for the value of the FBD? Observe that this is a non-concurrent force system, meaning we can use the three equations, summation of forces along x equals zero, summation of forces along y equals zero, or summation of moment equal to zero. Summation of forces along x will not allow us to uh, solve for the value of FBD, Likewise, summation of forces along Y, since there is also a reaction at node A. So the most convenient solution to directly solve for FBD is to perform summation of moment about point A. Cancel out the values, uh, the forces or the reaction at node A. There, uh, there will be two reactions at A, a horizontal reaction and a vertical reaction that will eventually cancel out if we perform summation of moment at A because it passes at the moment center. So performing summation of moment at A, so we have uh, FBD times the distance 3 minus T times 7, then that will all be equal to 0. Substituting the value of T equals to 100, then solving for FBD that is equal to 200 33.33 kilonewton. Now you have the value of the internal reaction, FBD. I think we can now proceed with the calculation of the deformation of rod BD. Now, uh, the deformation of the rod BD can be determined using this stiffness equation. So, or the flexibility equation rather. Because L over AE is the flexibility. The stiffness equation is the other, uh, the other manipulation of this equation wherein you are solving for P. If you're solving for P, that is the stiffness equation. But if you're solving for the deformation, that is the stiffness uh, flexibility equation. So, we can now solve for the deformation of BD since we know the internal reaction FBD. We know the length of the rod BD. We know the cross-sectional area and the modulus of elasticity. So let's substitute the value, provide that, that we will uh, use the appropriate units. So since this is expressed in kilonewton, I think it is more convenient to express this one in newton. And the length is 4 meters, convert it to 4,000, divided by the area, 2,500. And uh, the modulus of elasticity is already in megapascal, so we can use that directly, 200,000. So the deformation of rod BD is equals to 1.87 millimeters. Now, uh, let us see how uh, point C will uh, displace. So if there is a deformation of rod BD, so it contributes to the deformation of, uh, 
or the displacement of point C. So you can see in the schematic diagram here, uh, the deformation of DD will help us solve for the uh, displacement of load C. So this is just an exaggerated visualization to, for you to appreciate the deformation of load C. So using trigonometry, we can actually solve for VC or the displacement of node C by similar triangles. So the deformation of BD is to 3, deformation or displacement of node C over 7, and it's the substitu substitution of the displacement of BD which is equals to 1.87. You can solve for the vertical displacement of node C that is 4.35 millimeters. Now proceeding with the second uh, question, Second question, um, if the maximum allowed displacement of C is 2 millimeters, how much force P is allowed? What is the maximum value of P that can be allowed in the system? Or what is the cross-sectional area of BD? So that the displacement, I'm sorry, uh, this is not, uh, the value of P here is still constant at the value. The value is 100 kilometer. So if the displacement is limited to 2 millimeters having the same value of P, what will be or what should be? Uh, the minimum area required for BD such that it will not exceed 2 millimeters. Now we can do a back uh, calculation wherein if this is 2 millimeter, we can solve for the maximum allowed deformation of uh, point B or displacement of point B. Now the displacement of point B is actually the deformation of BD. So if we solve for the uh, the maximum value of C at 2 mm, we can solve the for the maximum uh, displacement of point B by using similar triangles. And this one can be determined by VB is to 3 and VC is to 7. And then substituting the value of VC to be equal to 2. And then the VB now uh, should not exceed 0 0.8571. If we want to keep uh, the value of displacement at point C within 2 millimeters. Then you have to limit the maximum displacement of point B to 0 0.8 to 6 millimeter. Now this deformation or displacement of at point B is the maximum deformation allowed for this rod B. Now this is actually a design aspect. You are to design what should be the cross-sectional area to not exceed this much uh, deformation. Now, the internal force will still be the same for the object, but we are now to solve for the area. So the deformation is limited. The force is the same from our calculation, the length and the modulus of elasticity. So this uh, deformation is the maximum value of VB allowed equals to the deformation of rod BB. The force is the internal reaction at BB by performing summation of moment at A. We have already solved that. And we are solving for the area divided by 200,000 megapascal. And then the area is 5,445 square millimeter. And that is the, the sign. And now we were, are able now to investigate and design correctly the materials based on actual deformation of an object. Thank you very much and uh, we are now time for open forum and evaluation. So if you have time to answer the evaluation form, I will uh, include the link in this video. If you have any comments or questions, you can type that in the comment section of this Thank you very much for listening and I hope you learned a lot from this lecture.